Okay, now to, to, to really have to come to grips with modern physics, I've slowed this entire slideshow down. I know it'll make it a little bit long, but we need to talk about radiation, just like we need to talk about Kevin. It's a movie, by the way. We need to talk about Kevin. Um, atoms. Basically, you might, might remember this from Junior Sir. The idea is that the top number, the bigger number, is called the mass number. The mass number is the protons plus neutrons, the total number of bits in the nucleus, the total number of thingies. Nucleons is what they call it, but thingies will do. And the atomic number, which is just protons, because if you change the number of protons, you change the element you've got. Carbon is carbon because it has six. Nitrogen has seven. If you add another proton, you change it from carbon to, to nitrogen, you see. And if you add one more again, you change it to oxygen. I'm looking at a periodic table. I'm not remembering this. Uh, helium. Helium is the basic one with everything in it. You've got electrons orbiting around. You have protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Right, there are four forces of nature. This is not like something from Aristotle where, you know, one of them involves swallowing a frog or anything like that. No, this is actually the four forces of nature as defined by symmetry or supersymmetry or any of those theories which are nice and easy to hold in your hand, like, you know, string theory. Anyway, there are four forces of nature. The most powerful and shortest range is strong nuclear. It holds the nucleus together. It stops the protons, which are all positive, pushing each other apart. The next strongest, which is the pushing each other apart one, but also the one which holds the electron to the nucleus in an atom, is the electromagnetic. This is between positive and negative charges. So the strong nuclear overcomes electromagnetic in the nucleus, but as soon as you get outside the nucleus, the distances are too far, it doesn't have any effect. And so the electron is held to the nucleus by the electromagnetic force. Next in order of strength comes the very shadowy weak nuclear force, which is only associated with the decay of the beta particle. It's, it's some, another force, definitely, but it only associated with beta decay. If it's not a, not a beta decay, it really isn't important. And the final, uh, the most interesting and the longest range, but also the weakest by far, is gravitational. Gravitational, quite weak. I know it's difficult to believe, but we are standing on a planet, which is a large object. Gravity does exist between all masses, but uh, it's only of any sort of significant size when you get the sort of planet sized dimensions. Now, the thing about gravity, which makes it difficult mathematically to tie into the other three, is because it's only positive. It is very long range, but it's only positive. But it's also the weakest. OK, so where did... Uh, radiation come from? Well, it was always there. It was discovered, uh, like America was discovered, except that um, there was no one already looking at it and saying, oh, we've been using this for years, like America. Uh, the natives, for instance, Australia. Captain Cook discovered Australia, apparently, and all the people who were living there beforehand were always very confused by that because they thought they knew it was there. Um, anyway, so he discovered uh, radiation. This is a guy called Henry Becquerel. There he is up at the top in a very fuzzy picture. A daryotype, I suspect. It's a very old photo, that. It was, and this is before, actually, he discovered it. He discovered it in the 1890s. So um, this sparked a great deal of interest. And by 1927, everything was done. So, you know, in one career of one person, everything had been achieved. So Becquerel discovered that if you put photographic plates near a radioactive source, or, or something he later discovered was a radioactive source, that it fogged the plate. It made like tracks. And this, he presumed, was something coming out of the radioactive rock, uh, which uh, would um, could be detected by the film, but not by the eye. And he was right. It was radiation. And luckily, the type of things he dealt with weren't particularly harmful. Later people on who did it without realising what they were doing killed them, like Marie Curie. But he discovered it. Uh, we named the unit of decay after him. So if there's one decay per second, that's called one Becquerel. And 12,000 decays a second is 12,000 Becquerel. And a million decays per second is basically a lethal dose. So I don't know if we've got a name for that other than Becquerel lethal. Or, you know, it's probably a mega Becquerel. There's always these things, isn't there? So if radiation is the decay of a substance with uh, the admission of one or two uh, 
or even more, radioactive particles. So it's the decay of a nucleus. It's not the decay of an atom, by the way. Decay of a nucleus. That's very important. That's why it's nuclear physics, because we're talking about just the nucleus, not the atom as a whole. So if we do that, then we have to have an equation for this decay. And these are the way these equations work. Basically, you have the elements like proton, neutron and electron are written with their mass number at the top and their atomic number at the bottom. Chemistry, they often do it the other way around. Not important. They both work fine. But say, for instance, if you're looking at a decay, then the top line, the mass number and the bottom line, the atomic number, both must balance both of them. Now, it's very easy. It's just a matter of adding and subtracting. But they both balance. If you look at the top line here, uh, the both sides add up to 238 and the bottom line, both sides add up to 92. It's a little bit more complicated when you come to the electron because there is a negative number there. There you are. See, that's, a, that's the electron over there. There's a negative number, but we can cope with that as well. It's still adding up and subtracting. So the first particle we have to look at is the alpha particle. That's this symbol for the alpha particle. It's just the alpha from the Greek alphabet. Uh, it's a helium nucleus. Helium nucleuses are very stable, incredibly stable compared with other nucleuses. And so they hang around together. And if they can, if they're moving at any speed, they form a particle which we detect as radiation. They're positive because they've been stripped of their electrons. So there's just two protons, which makes them positive. And they're very, very heavy compared with everything else that's moving around. They are thousands of times heavier than most other radioactive particles. So they're incredibly heavy. This incredible punch means they're very ionizing. So basically, they are enormous things, which if they do hit you in the wrong place, they're going to cause a lot of damage. Now, the damage they do is ionization. They turn something which is neutral into an ionized. I.e., they, it's lost some of its electrons, which is a very bad thing. Cancer. Yes, because you can... The, can form cancer. It ionizes cells within the body, which are called free radicals. They go on to form cancerous cells, blah, 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 blah. But I don't want to be flippant about all this, but you know, this is what you're, you're supposed to be as, as a Westerner. This is an, a, a, a decay where an alpha particle is formed. That's a way of writing alpha. We can also write it like that, okay, with the alpha symbol. But this alpha particle is decaying from uranium-238. Now, we call it 238 because that's the um, isotopic number of the uranium. There's lots of isotopes of uranium. So to distinguish them, we give them the number, their mass number. So we call it uranium-238, just like that is thorium-234. See, that's how we say it. We, we, can't, we wouldn't say 92 because, of course, uranium has to be 92. So the additional piece of information we need is the mass number, because if you say uranium, it's automatically 92. That's how it works. So if you add up again, as I was talking about the top line, you can also bombard things down at the bottom there. You can also bombard things with uh, alpha particles and change elements. This is a uh, alpha particle hitting a nitrogen 14 atom. Uh, the nucleus absorbs the alpha particle and turns into the nucleus of oxygen, 17, and also releases a proton, which we write as H because a proton and the nucleus of a hydrogen are exactly the same thing. There's, there's no difference between them. Then we have beta particles. There's a beta particle. A beta particle, again, just a Greek letter for beta, is a very fast electron coming from the nucleus. Now, as all electrons, it's negative. It's a little bit penetrating and it's a little bit ionizing. It's moderate in both effects. A moderate atom. It's the uh, it's the uh, country and Western music, really, of the... Actually, it's not as bad as that. Uh, so, beta particles, as you can see, there's still a balanced equation. Because there's zero here, there's no change to the mass number. But because it's minus one, minus... 91 minus 1 gives us 90. So the bottom balance is by subtraction. That number goes up when we have a beta decay. The atomic number rises by 1. Here is it again. And as you can see, once again, the atomic number rises by 1. The mass number doesn't change. This is the atomic creation for this 
beta particle, which is just an electron. Obviously, it's called a beta particle because we didn't know it was an electron when it was given its name. Now, the last type, the most penetrating but least harmful, is the gamma ray. You can be millions of gamma rays can pass through you all the time, in fact, often do, and they have no effect on you because they don't cause many ions. And because they're, they're, uh, they're only for the release of energy, they can happen at any time, even associated with a beta of an alpha decay as well. So what a gamma ray is, is just a form of electromagnetic radiation, like light, like x-rays, like radio waves, like infrared. They're all forms of electromagnetic radiation. And they come in little packages called photons, as all EM waves do. They don't have any charge because they're weights. And they're not affected, therefore, by electric or magnetic fields. So that's a gamma ray. And that's the third type. And we only have the three types, alpha, beta and gamma, we have to think about. First thing we have to know is that alphas uh, easily stop. A piece of paper will stop an alpha. A piece of tin foil will stop a beta, which is why all those people walk around with tin foil hats, because they're trying to stop the beta waves getting into their head, which will then, you know, tell the CIA where they are. That seems perfectly sensible to me. I always wonder why President Trump doesn't wear one. And then there's um, the, um, presumably because there's nothing in there to get. I think that must be it. Anyway, um, gamma. Gammas go uh, through uh, paper and aluminium foil and will go through quite a lot of concrete. So you need about uh, two metres, roughly. If you have two metres of concrete, that will stop um, a gamma. You can also have about uh, 30 centimetres of lead will do the same job. We'll stop it. Um, lead and concrete combination, almost unfoldable. Now, some of them will get through, but so few not to worry about. You've got, to, you've got to set limits on these things. Now, I include this, not to confuse you, but just to say, understand that, you know, while there are many types of decays, they form these long chains, they only happen one at a time. So you get an alpha decay, then a beta, a beta, then another alpha, then an alpha, going down. So the uranium-238, which is the most common form of uranium, forms lead-206. Now, the thing, as it says at the bottom, Lead-206 is a stable isotope, the normal isotope of lead. And it seems that quite a lot of the lead we have in the planet was once uranium, that it's uh, decayed. Now, the half-lives of each of these is different. Some of them are very quick. There's a couple here where the half-life is just a few, few hours. Whereas the very first one, the thorium decay, that half-life, as I remember rightly, is about 10 million years. I think it's 10 million years, that decay. And others of them are similar sort of orders of magnitude. Now, there's a couple here that are a billion years, actually. Now, as the Earth is four billion years old, any uranium-238 which is left is just an undecayed portion. So there was an awful lot more uranium-238, and we've just got, just got less of it because it hasn't decayed yet, basically. OK, so what do these particles do in a electric field? Well, an alpha particle will go towards the negative because it's positive. And a beta particle, which is negative, will go towards the positive. That seems perfectly understandable. And because there is no charge on the gamma, it goes straight through. That's the gamma going straight through, ignoring the magnetic field entirely because it's an uncharged wave. What's detecting it is something called a cloud chamber. Now, a cloud chamber is just a super saturated area where as a particle passes through, it creates little clouds, exactly like the vapour trails uh, a plane makes when there are planes in the sky again, um, exactly like a vapour trail. So anybody listening to this later will know that this was done during lockdown. Um, so these vapour trails, they're made by aeroplanes, can also be made by these particles in a cloud chamber. And uh, basically you get a super saturated solution and as the particle passes through it, it creates, it turns the vapour into a liquid droplets for a moment before disappearing again. And you can see these vapour trails. Now, um, the beta is just a much smaller there. You see it gets a much smaller path because being lighter, it's easier to um, attract it to the positive. It takes less energy to attract it so it's going to be spinning over towards it now the reason they travel in a circle is something called fleming's left hand rule this has got to do with the fact that any charged particle moving in an electric field will travel in a circular motion because the force is always at right angles to the direction of motion just like the string 
uh, in a pendulum, makes the pendulum move in a circle, makes it move in a, uh, uh, an arc. And this is exactly the same for a particle. The force is like the string to its velocity. It's always at right angles to the direction it's travelling at, so the particle moves in a circle. Uh, and we give it the name Fleming's left hand rule because Fleming described how this works and used his left hand as an illustration as to the way the forces work. And we'll talk about this in electricity. Here's an example of some circular motions. This is a very early photograph taken in a cloud chamber. The lines across are just lines of the photograph That's because the photograph is taken in a particularly odd way. But um, since it was the only way they could do it at the time, it was to do with um, the fact the cameras were much, much simpler. But this is a cloud chamber picture and you can easily see that there are two types of particle. And I think you'll agree with me that it's obvious that because this one is bending much more, this must be the beta and this must be the alpha. OK, you also can just see, we have drawn cleverly over it, a straight line going down the screen. That's the uh, gamma. OK, now how do we tell that uh, these particles ionise? Well, actually, it's quite simple. Uh, you charge an electroscope. Now, this is one of these devices that's meant to detect static electricity. Uh, here, we're going to just use it to show static electricity is lost. So we charge it up completely. And when you charge it up, the little leaf down there at the bottom, there you see it? It hangs out from the body because they're both charged negative. So because light charges repel each other. Now you bring a radioactive source close to that. And what it does is all the little positives coming from the alpha, they're meant to be pluses, by the way. There you are. All the little pluses, they balance the negative of the electroscope. And what happens is the electroscope becomes neutral. So the leaf collapses. So you physically see the leaf. You can't see the alpha particles. You can't see the negative charges. But because the alpha particles cause the electroscope leaf to collapse, to come back down towards the stalk, you know it's neutralised the electroscope. And that proves that it has an ionising effect, that it changes the ionisation of objects. And that's a proof. Now, ionising power is very important. The most ionising is alpha. Alpha is a tremendous poison. All alpha sources are. If you swallow them, they can kill you, particularly polonium, which is a very, very dangerous isotope, discovered, obviously, by Marie Curie, because it's called polonium after Poland, which is her native country. Uh, betas, which are more common, are everywhere, stopped by your skin most of the time, but they're not really ionising anyway, very difficult. Whereas gammas, you have to get billions of that before they're doing you any harm. They're more likely to cook you than they are to give you cancer. Gamma are only very slightly ionising. But alphas, if they're inside your body, if they're not stopped by the skin, which they normally are, and they get physically inside your body and they get into contact with the soft tissue of your cells, they can give you cancer really, really, really quickly because they are incredibly heavy and they ionise almost everything they touch. So very ionising alphas, not very ionising gammas. How do we detect them? Well, there's two ways. I always start with this one because otherwise people never remember it because they, they know the other one so well. The best form of detector really is called a solid state detector. It's something called a uh, PN junction. We know it as a diode. And it's in reverse bias. So no electricity is flowing. Now, when a particle like an alpha, for instance, passes through this layer between them where there's no particles it causes little particles to form it ionizes knocks things out and what happens is these electric charges they go towards the negative and uh, cause a pulse of electricity to pass and we count the number of pulses and that gives us a uh, count of how many particles pass through this area and we can scale it up because we know how big that area is so one pulse means one particle the one you'd have heard of was the Geiger Muller tube. Some people call it the Geiger counter, which is a bit unfair on Mr. Muller, who did just as much, if not more, than the, of the work. The Geiger Muller tube is basically a tube of partially evacuated gas with a very thin window made of a material called mycolite, 
which is the same material that's used to insulate the element in an electric iron. Um, very, very thin crystalline window and all the particles can actually go through it. It doesn't matter what they are. Particularly betas find it no trouble to go in, but alphas can get in as well. That's how thin and how easy it is for them to get in. Once they get in, they strike one of the particles and there's an avalanche, an avalanche towards this central wire, which is very thin, causing a hugely intense electric field around it. Uh, they hit the wire all basically at the same time and you get a blip of electricity as the particles hit. Um, and that's it, basically, this avalanche effect of ionising gases. So basically, again, the betas ionise the gas. And of course, what's wrong with this is that both of them require the ionising ability. So neither of them can detect really well gamma sources. Um, they can, but it's a bit more complicated. And no, easy, no easy way to explain it either, I can tell you. Now, all experiments involving radioactive materials all involve a detector and a source. Basically, the detector and the source are put in different configurations to do the experiments. So, if you're looking at distance, you just have detector source, move them apart. If you're looking at time, detector source, take the, take the reading every five minutes. If you're looking at penetration, yeah, no, I'm, no, 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 please don't. If you're looking at penetration, then it's a detector and source, and you put different things between them, different barriers. Again, keep your mind up, the gutter. Right, so we'll start with that one. Uh, basically, you basically have your detector. And you have your source. And you look at what can get through the barrier. Very simple experiment. Detector, source, barrier, penetration. Distance. Detector, source, distance between them. Plot the graph. Half-life, which is a time experiment. Detector, source, Take a reading every minute. That this, this is not really, it's literally not rocket science, this stuff. It's incredibly easy. So, Half-Life. What is Half-Life? Well, the animated section of this is much better. I advise you to go to the PowerPoints, as I often do, which are on the um, WordPress uh, document I've sent you all. And look at this uh, animation as it goes along. But basically what you're saying is that every time we get to a Half-Life, which might be, a year, say it's a year. So say that the half-life was a year. So after one year, half of the stuff will have decayed. Let's change the color, that's not showing up very well, is it? That's better. Okay, half the stuff will have decayed. All right, so that's half the stuff decayed, that's one half-life. So in the next year, after two years then, another half of the remaining stuff. Now, why not all of it? Well, it's because it's based on probability. It's the probability of winning. If you have a thousand, then the probability of half of them will be, you know, the same. In each case, the following year, it's a half of the remaining ones. Because it's based on probability and not any sort of time factor, it decays to half, to half, to half, and half. And as you quickly think, after three, half again, after four, half again, basically, you're never going to get to zero number of nucleuses, never going to get to zero atoms not decayed. This is because, of course, um, there are so many atoms, there's always going to be some left. Uh, and you're, then you're talking about uh, safe levels. So the half-life is the time it takes for half the radioactive particles to decay. So let's look at this. This is probably an easier way of looking at it in some way than the graph. If you start with 4,000 particles at the very beginning, if the half-life is three seconds, then after three seconds, 2,000 of the particles will be left undecayed. Now, I don't mean there's only 2,000 left. There are 2,000 of the original. If it decays to something else, there's 2,000 of the new ones. So there's 4,000 in all still, 2,000 of the old ones, 2,000 of the new ones. After six seconds, there were 1,000 of the original particles. And then after nine, 500, and it keeps halving. Now, when you're down here at 125 particles will start, I'm not gonna halve that because you can't without getting a fraction. Um, you're down to 15 seconds. That's after five half-lives, it's 15 seconds. You see it's halved, halved 15 seconds is halved five times, you see. But there are now 3,800 
and 75 of the particles it's decayed to. So they haven't disappeared or gone away. They've just changed into something else. This calculation gives us something we definitely need. This is called the decay constant. It's just this formula. Uh, it's used in a, for, in a calculation, but this is the half-life. Now it has to be in seconds. Now in questions, you often get this often quoted in years or months or minutes, but to do the calculation, you always have to convert it to seconds. And this is the calculation I'm talking about. And this is the important formula. There it is in the middle. This is the rate of decay, how fast it's decaying. Now it's from calculus and I'm sure some of you haven't done it. You see it also written A is equal to lambda times N. N is the number you start with, it's number. So it's literally how many particles you start with. And this, the lambda, that's a lambda, looks like a giraffe, it's actually a lambda, it's a Greek letter. And it's the number of particles decaying per second. And it's called, of course, the decay constant, which we just worked out on the previous slide. It's the natural log of n divided by the half-life. The natural log of n, the number was there. All these are in the logbook. You don't have to remember any of these. You just have to be able to manipulate these formula. Plug numbers into the formula. Get used to plug and play formula. Very important. So, supposing you were to start with 100 grams of sulfur 35, which has a half-life of 87.51 days. How much time will it take before only 12.5 will decay? Well, all you have to do is work out how many half-lives between 100 and 12.5. So you half it once, you get 50. You half it twice, you get 25. You half it three times, you have 12 and a half grams. So that's three half-lives. So if each half-life is 87.51 days, we multiply three by 87.51, three half-lives, each half-life is 87.51 days, you get 262 days. So in 262 days, you will have 12 grams, 12.5 grams of the original sulfur 35. You still have 100 grams. I mean, you still have a 100 grand sample. It's just only 12 and a half grams of that sample is now sulfur 35. The rest of it's something else, but still has weight. You don't lose weight. Well, you might lose a tiny bit, but you won't be able to measure it with a scale. It's too tall, tiny. OK, so another question. You uh, measure the radioactivity of a substance, then you measure it 120 days later and you find only 25% less. Well, if it's 25%, that's two half-lives. There's two. One, two half-lives. OK, if two half-lives is 120 days, well, this is a rocket science, one half-life must be 60 days. Do you get the idea? It's halving every half-life. So, you know, these calculations are based on that rather simple fact. So, your professor gives you uh, 64 grams of sulfur phosphorus 32. Presumably he doesn't like you and he wants to see you die in agony. And what's the decay constant to start off with? Well, that's the formula for the decay constant. That's uh, 0.693. That's the natural log of 2. There's various reasons for this, but it's natural log of 2 divided by the half-life. Now, the half-life, as I said, is quoted in days, and it must be in seconds. So we times by how many hours in a day, how many minutes in an hour, and how many seconds in a minute. And with those three things multiplied, we get a time, and then we get an answer, which is usually a very small number, and the units are per seconds, because the only unit in here is time in seconds, and it's a reciprocal, so it's per second is the unit. That's the decay constant. Now it says, what's the activity rate? What's the rate of decay? What's the A? What's the dn by theta? Well, to get that, we've got to multiply how many there were originally. 64 grams of phosphorus is two moles. Me explaining moles at this point is way beyond it, but each mole, it's twice, basically, it's twice the um, mass number. Two moles is two times Avogadro's number. Chemists will understand. There you are. Two times Avogadro's number. That's the decay constant from the previous page. This is the formula I said we were going to use. One mole. See, there's two moles because there's twice the 
atomic number. This is Avogadro's number, which you look up in the log tables. That's the number you start with. So you times the number by the decay constant and you get there, the decay. It's producing 7.3 times 10 to the 17 becquerels. That's how many particles are being emitted every second. So don't swallow the bleeding thing. It'll hurt you. There's all people always asking Junior, sir, will this kill me if I eat it? Yes. Yes, it will. Right. So, isotopes. Yeah, could I, when I do the joke about Springfield baseball team, seems a little silly, really, isn't it? Really silly. So let's leave it. Isotopes. Same atomic number, different mass numbers. So, for instance, hydrogen, the simplest thing, has two rather famous isotopes. We add one neutron and we get deuterium. So H2 is deuterium. H3 or 3H is tritium. Now, these two isotopes play an immense, important role in powering the sun, particularly tritium. And without them, we wouldn't have any energy on Earth. There wouldn't be any life anywhere in the universe. So solar energy or star energy, if you're not on our one, is created by the fusion, the joining together of these isotopes of hydrogen to form helium which also has its hydrogen, has a so hydrogen, also has its isotope, there it is, helium-3. Lithium also has isotopes, lithium-6 and 7. Lithium-6 has 6. Lithium-7, bizarrely enough, has 7. Now, to be lithium, it still has, in red, as you can see, protons, the same number of protons. What changes is the number of Neutrons, and that changes the mass number, the total number of particles. So there's a variation in the number of neutrons doesn't make it a different substance chemically. And this is why they're called isotopes, because chemically they behave the same. It's only when we do uh, physics experiments on them we find out they're different. Now, of course, the most famous isotope is carbon-14. Carbon-14 has two more neutrons then carbon-12. They both have six protons, or else they wouldn't be carbon. But carbon-14 has two more neutrons. It has a different mass number. Now, why is this important? Because at the moment that any organism dies, then the carbon-14 to carbon-12 balance is the same as it has been since prehistory. I mean, we're talking about 100,000 years. We know carbon-14 is exactly the same quantity. But, of course, when we die, this carbon-14, which is radioactive, it begins to decay. As it decays, the percentage against carbon-12 decreases. And by looking at this percentage, we can say how long ago something died. Right now, this is a little bit of an exaggeration because the dinosaurs lived 60 million years ago. Carbon-14 dating isn't really very useful after 100,000 years. So we have to use uranium dating. Uranium-238 decays at a different rate to uranium-235. So we can find trace elements of those two within the, within the skeleton. Then we can. Now, above the whole body, the amount of uranium is quite small. But in the skeleton is where it all is. So we can use uranium dating on the dinosaurs and we find out that the last one large dinosaur that walked the Earth was 60 million years ago, and that they all seem to have died roughly at the same time. Uh, not all dinosaurs, but all the ones, you know, all the later ones seem to have died at the same time, which is where we get this idea of the massing asteroid hitting the Earth. But they're all done by uh, decay dating. Carbon-14 dating is more used in human history. So we can tell when the humans left Africa. We can tell them when they populated Australia. If, you know, that's the first wave of humans populated Australia. The second bunch were just a bunch of criminals. So what do we use radioactive isotopes for? Well, we mostly use them for medicine, uh, treating uh, cancer, imaging cancer. We can use them in smoke detectors. Uh, to irradiate food, to kill germs when there's not enough water available, and, of course, for carbon dating, for dating fossils. But as I say, I, they call it carbon dating, but other materials also used for things which are further older. This is the experiment. This is the question, which is, in fact, fine. You can run through it in your head. It won't take an awful long time 
to jot everything down. I don't think there's anything here that I have to talk about. They're all covered in this section. Good luck.